Ladies and gentlemen, last day of the DMS Expo Fair, but uh, first day of our international program, because in a world of globalization of information, we cannot stop at the frontiers of Baden-Württemberg or at the frontiers of Germany. And so I have the pleasure today to run the second international business track, where we're trying to give you a view of what is happening outside of this hall, outside of Germany, on the international market. And I'm very glad that um, we have a lot of really great speakers today here assembled to give you, you their visions what is information management today. Well, there are a lot of acronyms, there are a lot of words around, but we face really a great challenge today because everybody who has been visiting this DMS Expo Fair for some years knows that we are really in a disruptive change. A change that has influence on the industry, has influence on the workplace, and has influence on our day-to-day -day life. So we titled the three sets of our panel discussion with small um, provocative presentations to the future of the industry, which means the information management industry, the future of the workplace, which probably means that we arrive at the paperless office. But most important, what happens to us? the future of the information society. So there are quite a lot of topics to discuss from cloud, mobile, big data, from the shift from ECM to EEM. You know, the German association just announced that they will change their focus and their name from DMS and ECM to enterprise information management. We face every week new technologies, especially in the mobile arena, we have the big fight between SAS, cloud, and on-premise, especially in the light of all these data scandals, and quite a lot of other trends, and we're very glad because this week the new Gartner Quarren is out for ECM, and I knew the new Forrester Wave is out as well, and probably we get some information as well on this. We have some bullet points here make or buy, spend more time on small innovations, and I believe a very big topic for all these vendors here, consumerization of IT. The future of the workplace is our second set, which will give a view not only what happens in the office today, but what will happen to everybody of you in the next year. I always say um, that the office today is the last oasis where you can really work like you like, not in a factory. And this industry is about automation and destroying this oasis. So new technologies is one side, but the other side is a real change in how we work. Some bullet points. Will there be a paperless office? What impact will these trends have on us all. And the last of our three sessions is on the future of information society. Everybody talks about information society, but nobody knows it. The time is too short. The innovation cycles get too fast. We can hardly react. And I think we have all to find a new role as members of this society. So, what we will do is, with our great participants, to give you, and I hope there will come some more, some insight what you don't get at ever other events, because to get somebody like these participants here to a place in Germany, normally 
as a end user or vendor, you have to put on some several thousand bucks on the table. So take your chance and meet Andrew Graham. Andrew Graham, old friend of mine who is in the industry for really 20 years or longer, at least we know each other for 20 years, and he is working for AIM International. AIM International is the leading association with more than 70,000 vendors and end user uh, members. And not all know this, AIM is the association who created the ECM vision, and AIM is the association who puts in place all of these standards, like CMIS, like PDFA, and all the other stuff. So it's one of the most important players, unfortunately not known in this marketplace. Secondly, I welcome Rich Medina from Doculabs. By the way, Doculabs was really engaged uh, in the creation of ECM, and I know the first uh, folders and so on were created by Doculabs, and I'm really great to have you here in Europe for the first time, I think. And Doculabs is one of the most important analyst and research company focusing on our industry. And uh, Chicago-based, that's really a long travel. But be sure, not only Chicago is windy and misty, Stuttgart can be as well. Gerd Kritter, well, his travel was a little bit shorter from the Netherlands. And Gerd is in our industry um, as long as I am, and we are meeting regularly. And every time it comes to who needs to be bought, well, I always think of Gerd Kritter because he works for Document Boss, and Document Boss is one of the leading consulting companies for mergers and acquisitions in our industry. And he will give us some very interesting insights what mergers and acquisitions mean for innovation. So, Ulrich Leutner, old friend of mine, I'm very glad that you made it from California. And uh, Ulrich has been here in several different positions. I think now you're Director Marketing International for ECM, is it correct? Well, I'm very glad uh, that the faces don't change, but only the titles. And even I think um, your telephone number stays the same. Um, Ulrich Leutner is one of the guys who leads IBM, the major player in this uh, market, through these challenges of positioning IBM, not only as a product company, but as well as a service company, and keeping IBM in lead of the ECM market. And I'm very glad uh, that since those times, from Filenet to IBM, that there's a big continuity in what IBM is doing in this market. And if we talk about long-term preservation of information, of, about information availability, about global access to information, that IBM really plays a major role. Thanks for joining here. Cheryl McKinnon, um, I'm really very glad that we have two ladies on the panel. Excuse me, but I put this in alphabetic order, so you're coming late. But, uh, you know, the good things always come at last. Shell McKinnon is in the industry now as well. I can't remember, with AIM and other companies, with vendors. And uh, Cheryl um, is the one with Forrester who cares for the analysis of this industry. And everybody knows there are only very few renowned international companies out who analyze the market. And the good with Forrester is they have not only a close view on ECM, but they always put it in a big picture because ECM is only part of the information scene. And I'm very glad that you took the long way to Germany to represent Forrester here and give us some new insight about the wave, probably. I even will give you the chance to change your slides if you have the wave with you. So, Pamela Doyle. Very glad to have you here because you fulfill two roles. Uh, one is um, representing a speaker in the US, Fujitsu, one of the major players. Unfortunately, you're mostly known for your scanners, but I know that you do quite a lot of other things. And Pamela plays a very big role in standardization. 
making this industry cooperate and work with train, for example, and today as well as director with AIM. And I'm glad that we have been both in this illustrious round. And Fujitsu America, uh, probably even your colleagues from Fujitsu might not know what the big strategy is, and they should sit here. Thanks for joining. Last not least, Mika Makitalo. Mek Mika has as well two hats. Uh, one is being one of the brains behind a new concept to handle information, which is a lot of different, um, like all the other vendors here. And the other thing is, um, he takes the time to lecture at the university and to share his knowledge with the students to make the next generation follow his path. So really a pleasure to have somebody from Finland here um, for M-Files, which unfortunately is not very much known in Germany. So take the opportunity, meet your friends here. And the, I think the last, Lubor, Lubor Ptacek, Canada. So we have really six countries here represented. And uh, Lubor is one of the brains in open text. He's one of those who is promoting enterprise information management as the new roof, the new direction of the industry. And we have been working both on AIM. We have been working in standardization and he's really a great guy. And those who woke up early this morning could have met him running through the rain doing his traditional exercise in the morning, even in Germany. OpenText, by the way, is a very interesting company because that's still the only software vendor which has an international impact. It's quite different than IBM who sells everything with what they can grip on. But OpenText is the only true vendor of information management software. And it's really great to have you here, Luba, in our list this round. So, let's start from the beginning and doing some practice on the, the future of the industry. The format is new for Germany because we will have no long presentations. We will try to really discuss in between because we very seldomly meet <laughs> in this configuration and probably even might skip slides or even presentation really to bring it to the point. And uh, that means that some people will really present, some will sit around here and make some noise if those who present say rubbish. And if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and ask. We'll try to answer. So, future of the industry, Andrew, choose a seat. Um, Andrew is working on the vision um, not the next one, not my PC, not my PC, take yours. Andrew is one of the guys who works on the new vision of AIM on systems of engagement and I hope you will probably shortly explain what the difference between systems of engagement or systems of records, the old stuff which is sold here. Cheryl, if you like, you can sit beside him, but you can choose as well any other. Stool and uh, one of the theses of Cheryl is that she sees the ECM market and the vendors under pressure, under pressure of, of other developments, other industries, that companies with innovations are overcoming left and right those traditional vendors. Probably you can give us some insight on that. We have Rich Medina and um, he throws in a new term, well, participation management, Rich. We have so many terms. Why do you need a new one? You have to explain why it's not collaboration. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, Gerd, if you'd like to step us to us, um, I already announced um, that Gerd will focus a little bit on the impact of m &A and his opinion is it's good for the market. Sometimes end users don't believe this because they fear that the support will go. 
And last not least, we have um, somebody sitting together with us, that is Pam and Ulrich. And your important role will be, well, to come on here. Don't be lazy. Really, um, you will have the role of being the first who question the theses of those who we will present. But before we get in all these slide battles, general question to you all. And the question is, um, what is the criteria? <coughs> what are the criteria why we have an industry? Industry needs to have a fair, industry needs to have a name, industry needs to have an association, industry needs to have books, industry needs to have publication, industry needs to have um, standards, all the other stuff. And what we are doing now is shifting around from DMS to ECM to ECM to collaboration, systems of engagement, now to EEM. Does this make sense? Do we really have a well, one face to the market, or um, are we destroying our market with all of our acronyms? Any opinions on this? If you have an opinion, try to grab a microphone. Is this on? Can you hear me? You can hear me okay? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a core of requirements and of problems to solve and of difficulties that um, are addressed by some specialization and that is the dealing, of, uh, dealing with relatively unstructured information. So information that's typically in document form that's different from data that's in um, rows and columns and also different from pure communication, whether it's voice or text and so on. And Rich, Rich yes. I don't like this because this the separation of data and unstructured and content and other formats that is gone. Yeah. We, we cannot any longer keep the separation. That's all this information. We right. need to deal with this information. So I'm going to quote Aristotle, right? His definition of justice was mm -hmm. is to treat things differently that should be treated differently and treat them the same when they should be treated the same. And there are aspects of unstructured information of documents that are absolutely the same as structured data or communications or paper, but there are areas that are different and that should be treated different. And the wisdom comes and you win if you can do that properly. Treat documents like data when they should be treated the same like records and treat them differently um, when they must be in order to get the work done. Well, I believe it's all about the content of the information, that the content has to be treated in the same way, independently of the format. There should be no difference if a contract is made by email, in a PDF document, or in a scanned paper document. It's and always a contract. And I, I, would actually, I would actually concur with that. I think the blurring of the lines between structured and unstructured, that the time has come. It really is about the meaning of the content, whether that happens to be in an XML format Karen. or in a Word document. And if, even if we look at the content that we refer to as, quote, unstructured today, uh, a lot of it is much more structured than we really give it credit to. There's metadata, there's a structure in the language itself that we use, and this is why we see the rise of content analytics. So I think that that blurring of the line between structured and unstructured, that time has come. I very much agree, and I think that, of course, because of technical reasons and maybe even of historical reasons, we started with dealing and managing structured and un unstructured information in a different way. But the, um, the categorization that actually AIM promotes, and we talked about it, is you know, to talk about systems of engagements and system of records. And so the point about systems of engagement force us, actually, all to to cross those boundaries. In a system of engagement, there is no structured and no unstructured. It is whatever piece of information is relevant in that particular process or to make a specific decision. And I think that's what we're, we're after. What we're that sets it for you, Andrew. And you can use this microphone because I started your presentation okay. on the future of information management. And probably you have some answer for us.
Nein, ist okay. Jeder bleibt jetzt, wo er gerade einen Schlüssel mit. If this is working okay, well, the first thing I'll say that I completely agree with the, the difference between structured and unstructured is merged together. But I'm going to ask a question because as a user, does anybody here know the difference between structured and unstructured data? Raise your hands if you know the difference. Yeah, not many. Because the users don't really care. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But for structured data, the data the plumbing's in place to take care of structured data. It's already there. We can, it's more or less there. The infrastructures are there. But for the unstructured data, because of the volume, the variety, the velocity that it's coming at you, is so much of it, it's not manageable. It's not manageable with current systems, and, and we need to look at different ways of managing it because there's too much data there. Okay, I'll go through it. Uh, with, this, with this slide, uh, I've only got eight minutes, but with this slide, this, this is what I see as, as the biggest impact of current future IT information management. AIM is an association with 80,000 members, and most of those members are end users. So we get a pulse for what's really happening out there in the marketplace. And these are the differences. On the left-hand side, you have the past, and on the right-hand side, you have the future. You know, enterprise apps were all about internal, now they're out there in the cloud. And we think about things in a completely de different way with the systems of record versus the systems of engagement. Where the systems of record was all about compliance and governance and control from the IT departments, where that's all shifted now. If you ask the youths of today uh, who are, I don't know, some of the, the names like um, HP or IBM, they don't associate them with computers. They associate them with collaboration. They probably know more about Facebook than they would know about IBM, but we know more about IBM in our industry. So we need to change the way in which we talk to the industry, uh, to the, the users. And the main important thing is the shift of the balance of who owns the IT budget is moved, it's moved to business. It's moved out of the IT and into the line of business. They're the guys that control the IT budgets now. They want them for applications. And most end users don't want, we find, don't want more features in their products. They want the products that they've got to work and they want the collaboration of the old systems of record where it's about connecting computers to the new systems of engagement where it's about connecting people together. And enterprise boardrooms and, and, and businesses are still reeling from the legacy crash in, sorry, the crash in 2008, and they're questioning now legacy IT systems. So it's very important that the vendors here actually give the end users the features that they want. Um, when I was a young guy, uh, Business Week said that by 1980, the records wouldn't be managed by paper anymore. It would all be electronic. Well, that's not quite true. For the first time, actually, in our association of the industry watch, where we've gone out and checked the pulse of the industry, for the very first time, paper in, a, in, in, in businesses is either increasing slightly or staying plateaued. Over the last 10 years, it's been increasing dramatically. That's paper and documents. But if we look at data, in the last two years, we've created more data than in the entire conception of the computer moving me out. Am I eight minutes up already? So moving for that systems engagement, mobile is very, very key. Isn't it really? Am I finished? <laughs> so one minute. I say, so we've done a lot of research on the mobile market space and uh, we're finding that it's not just about um, inside your business, you want to get external to the customer. Things like uh, capture at the point of origination for a document is becoming very important. And end users now, most tablet, most um, organizations are using tablets internally. I'm under a lot of pressure. <laughs> most companies are using tablets internally for, for the simulation of information. So they need to be used for capture and deliver. But it's not just about taking photographs of, of, of pictures of signatures. It's about filling in web forms and using tablets to fill in information. I'll go through these stats very quickly. By the, the way, we will provide yeah. all of these slides on the internet as well with the videos. So, the actual data uh, um, that you create, all processes, is all about process. So, when you put your, your data or your documents into a process, all processes have either data or documents or information attached to it. So, it's the inputs and outputs that we need to be clear on. Yeah. Rich, I had the idea that you have another vision on it than we do. Do you want to use your slides here? You, you can use your slides. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so you know who I am. I'll just uh, move down. And I'd say that uh, none of these folks believe that there's no difference between data, unstructured and unstructured and so on. They're all Aristotelians. And that is, they all believe that if you, uh, if you, the, 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 fa the excitement here is that the realization that there are strong similarities between structured data, unstructured documents, and communications that we use, say, in social media and such. And that if you treat them differently in box, different boxes, you will lose out on most of the benefits. But on the other hand, I'm here to say that if, you don't, if you're superficially smoothing over the differences, anything you do will fail. And all these folks believe that. They have different systems, open text, IBM, um, M files, different systems for the structured data and the unstructured documents. They're all Aristotelians in that sense. So I'm trying to get down a little bit, um, being able to, the, the goal is to get the benefits of these new technologies here, but not hurt yourselves. Um, be able to control the costs and risks. In my thrashing, I'm moving through slides. So one of the things that has happened, let's say ECM started in 1982 or so with FileNet doing production imaging and such. One of the be things that's happened that's very exciting since about 2005 is broader and deeper human participation in collaboration and so on. And again, I have the question there, uh, the second bullet. How do you, the question is, how do you, it's an optimization problem. How do you get the benefits but not hurt yourself? Avoid the cost and risks as much as possible. And second thing is your roadmap. What should you do first? Should you, you know, provide external social media capabilities to everyone? Should you add mobility to your production workflow, mature ECM applications? Should you add it to your knowledge worker applications? Should you do something else? How do you do records management on governance and all of that? I recommend that the first thing you do is you need a good map, a usable map for what's going on in, you know, in, in what you think will happen in the next three years. And then you, I'll explain what you do after that. What we found to be useful um, is a useful map. It's not pretty, but it's useful for getting the stuff done, for making implementations in these infra enterprise information management that include both old style imaging and also new style mobile and social, or knowledge worker uh, activities and also um, you know, document activities, systems of engagement and systems of record, is to think of it in terms of three dimensions. Until about 2005, we were primarily talking about content management and process management, where content management is the management of document-like objects, and process management was the design and orchestration of processes of workflow. And pretty much the idea was what Ulrich said, you know, let's digitize and go paperless and let's automate, get rid of the mushy human stuff. What we've seen, what, what has never left us and it used to be an impediment and now we can actually take advantage of is active human involvement in the processes that particularly require uh, collaboration and creativity and so on. And so we think that a good way to talk about what's happening in the industry, particularly when you're trying to implement systems and strategize, is in terms of these three dimensions. And right here I'm focusing particularly on the increasing of human involvement that is broadening it, including more people inside and outside of your organization, but also deepening it. That is taking the capabilities of OpenText and M-Files and IBM and Fujitsu, providing it to more people um, in the organization. So providing, involving more people in, you know, um, in insurance workflow, in financial services workflow, and so on. I'm going to go in my remaining short period of time, I'm just going to step through some of these as you increase from very low participation management where you have the dream of 1990 that is perfectly paperless and perfectly automated to where we are now, which is called level three, level four, level five. We find this again to be useful, not as an intellectual exercise, but 
when we're thinking about helping folks, helping organizations move from where you are now, from here, to where you want to be, to there, and do in a series of steps where you reduce the risk of failure and your costs, but you gain benefit at each step. So the first level is, think of it as low enterprise participation. That is, it's, depart it's typically departmental or small enterprise types of content management, document management, imaging, and workflow, ranging from kind of the idiot simple hard drives, file management and hard drives, to the more complex um, uh, straight through processing, which is full automation, or very complex document content management, which is specialized component management, say in web content, or specialized records management. The next step is, am I okay on time, Ulrich? All right, he's making his way over here. As you increase the participation folks making it and the more complexity of the participation, you start stepping through levels. Level two, I'll just say, is where ECM has reached. They thought it would reach ubiquity, uh, be universal within organizations. It's not. Only a fraction of the folks who could have ECM today have ECM. Level three and four and five is when you start introducing mobile and social and the cloud. Level two to level three is where we're most interested in because this is where you're taking your first steps of adding mobility to open text and IBM and M files or adding sync and share and letting people outside the, the uh, organization um, participate. As you move on to four, it gets even more advanced to folks outside the organization and you're deepening collaboration, doing advanced case management that OpenText and IBM offer. And then finally, level five, which I've never seen except very superficially. All right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Level five. Come on. Oh, some comments you, for you. you. No, level five is still for you. We've only seen level five at very superficial basic content management and process management. <laughs> so in the next several years, we'll see it. Forrester talks about it with disaster management. Rich, and take the microphone. Management. Take a microphone again. Forrester talks about it with scenarios like with some of the, the smart processes they talk about with disaster management, where you need lots of content, complex content management. You need very structured workflow, but you also need the orchestration of people making fast, creative decisions. That's kind of the, the end point, the nirvana in this five-point scale. We have not seen that yet, but that's the trend. Um. I believe you're one of those people who are called an evangelist. Is that correct? <laughs> oh, Pam, uh, can I ask you I a question? A <laughs> you're, uh, Pam, could you please uh, answer one question? Um, you're on, on the board of directors of AIM International, and I know that AIM is discussing as well this question where to position. And there has been a lot of discussion on if the term ECM was not good to introduce all these features is technologies because it was always too much technology and we have to talk about the information itself. Will there be a change inside AIM leaving ECM, moving to AIM as an association of information management? Is there a chance for enterprise information management inside AIM? Um, I it's on. Is it on? Okay. Um, I, I think there is a, a chance for it. It's I personally feel like there's, it's kind of unfortunate because every time we get a name that takes hold, we change it again. I think we continue to confuse the end users about it. Um, but I think it, it, making the transition from enterprise content management to enterprise information management, I think that is a doable transition um, because we are focusing more on overall information regardless of format. So making the transition, I think, is fairly easy to go from ECM to EIM, mm -hmm. yes. Um, Andrew, we have a program for certification. We do ECM master courses. Will there be an enterprise information management master in the future? Yeah, I mean, as, as most people that know AIM know that the IM at the end stands for information management. 
the, the, the A stands for association, and the first I used to stand for imaging. Uh, we kind of changed that to intelligent, and I don't think it's actually changed. I don't, and, intelligent and, is very dangerous, I'm not sure. If well, intelligent, intelligent in software is not intelligent. Intelligent <laughs> information management, whether you do it with software, whether you do it with a filing cabinet, is what you need to do. It needs to be intelligent and you need to manage the information. And, and AIM's always been looking at that kind of level. And we, we, we start at that level so the end user can understand. Remember I said we had 80,000 uh, uh, members, most of them are end users. Some of them are records managers. They don't understand the terms and they have no interest in terms. But I disagreed with a little bit about what Rich said. I think that in process management on accounts payable, we are at level five. We can scan invoices in. We can classify and auto-classify. Right down to line item, you can store it, archive it, and retrieve it. So in certain processes where uh, paper-rich process and intensive process-rich governance is included in there, records management is included in there, we're kind of there. But, but in the new visions where mobile and social and, all, and big data, these terms that, that, that the uh, vendors create, that confuses the heck out of everybody. I mean, big. Big data is big content, is big chaos. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, um, you still produce the ECM wave. Will there be an enterprise information management wave? Will you use your, your slides? Do you want to use your slides? Probably it helps. So first off, just to address that one question, because I don't have a slide specifically on that, um, Forrester has been covering ECM for many years now, and just uh, last week we published the 2013 ECM wave, ranking uh, several of the vendors here. Um, when we look at EIM, we still see this as an emerging market, so we just uh, published our first research on that in the last uh, couple of months. So whether there'll be a wave in that in the future, time will tell, but what I think is really interesting is that uh, you know, uh, Pam's comment is that, you know, has ECM been too much about technology and is that part why we see some of the uh, struggles to get real success stories? I actually would agree it's because we've not relied enough on the technology. We, in, in the early days of ECM, especially in the records and document management world, we see very much that most of the vendors have essentially taken this mental construct of paper and put that onto the management of our digital and electronic content. And I think that's really where the, some of the roots of the uh, difficulties in user adoption has come from. So as we evolve into enterprise information management, I think there's a lot to be learned from the vendors and the uh, organizations that have successful mature data management programs. Um, working with some of my data management colleagues, when I compare the maturity levels of organizations uh, in terms of how they manage their structured data versus the maturity in their content management programs, the discrepancy is, is quite substantial. There's quite um, a, a larger or higher level of maturity on the structured data management programs than on the content management programs. So I think there's a lot to learn from that side of the house. So I'll continue with just a, a few points in terms of where, where Forrester sees the, the market going. Um, I do want to give some credit to one of my colleagues, Jiggs McQuivy, who published a book earlier this year that talks about digital disruption. And I think this is really important because we're starting to see digital dis disruption happen in the content and records management world. Uh, it means that when we look around the industry, there are new players coming into the market that are disrupting the traditional vendors, and they're using different platforms, different licensing models, different distribution methods, different uh, approaches to APIs and open standards. And I think that this is having an Im impact on how the uh, technology vendors are going to be evolving. When we take a look at some of the success rates and where organizations are, are seeing value in the ECM uh, employment, deployments that they have, uh, bottom line is that we think the status quo is simply not sustainable. Uh, the pace of digital innov innovation in terms of where new sources of content is coming from, uh, most of the tools in the market today are struggling to keep up. Uh, we see that there's very low adoption in terms of the capture, the management of things like social media, mobile messaging, uh, even extending into things like data management. Uh, so we, we need to take a look at how we can uh, look at fresh approaches to managing our organizational content. Just in 2000, uh, May of 2013, we did some ECM, uh, our annual ECM survey, and we found that in terms of ECM satisfaction levels, the most encouraging thing that I can say right now by looking at this data is that the level of dissatisfaction is decreasing. 
meaning that we're not seeing any kind of substantial increase in satisfaction levels, but we're seeing that more organizations are um, moving to neutral in terms of their, uh, basically their acceptance of ECM versus dissatisfied. So it's a really interesting trend. The bottom is coming up, but the top end in terms of satisfaction is not moving substantially. Cloud is not going to fix everything. Um, some really dramatic results. Cloud, we think, is absolutely going to be the direction of a lot of our content and information management systems. But the early adopters are struggling. Uh, if we look at the results between 2011 and 2013, we see substantial swings in terms of satisfaction and you know, expectations in terms of just how easy cloud deployments are going to be. And I think if we were to drill into this a little bit more deeply, we're going to see that this is where we see the distinction between hosted versions of legacy software systems versus true SaaS, which really are more turnkey. Uh, but integrations to other applications, APIs, this is where people are struggling. Um, the, in my opinion, looking at the market of e-discovery, I think that innovation right now in this market is happening in the e-discovery space with a lot of very sophisticated content analytics to very quickly go through large volumes of content, bring out concepts and uh, patterns of information. However, a lot of organizations are still in very, very early uh, experimental modes or you know, expressing interest but no real concrete plans to be able to move into this new area of auto classification using some of the new content analytic engines. The other thing that we're noticing, we did a report on continuous improvement in ECM uh, just a couple months ago, and we're finding that in order to raise those satisfaction levels for an ECM deployment, organizations are moving to a much more agile way of deploying or rolling out their user applications. Uh, we, found, we spoke to several uh, large organizations who initially had started out as a perceived failure of their ECM deployment using very big bang traditional waterfall methodologies. Everyone who then moved into an element of success had deliberately moved into much more iterative, consultative, collaborative a way of rolling out by engaging their business users very deeply. So what would we do with a clean slate? If we want to look at what the future of ECM is going to be, it's ubiquitous access to content anywhere, anytime, because it knows who I am. Uh, governance across the entire life cycle of content, not just at the end. And you know, this is where Forrester sees this direction is uh, towards a future of transparent content services, kind of taking the best from the on-premises legacy applications, blending the ease of use from a lot of the cloud, file sync and share, and even message archiving vendors. Thank you. Cheryl, stay. Um, when you're presenting figures here, is it a global market or is it the US view? Yeah, the survey stats that I've been looking at here come from a couple of different sources. Forrester does use a global uh, survey methodology, it does go out to all of our customers um, and plus target users. I would say that the numbers are probably higher skewed, the majority in the US and Canada, but it is a global representation. The most important question for us here is, is there still this proclaimed difference between the market in Europe or even in Germany to what is the US or global market? I would say that the primary difference is that when we look at the US market, we still are seeing a very heavy emphasis on uh, e-discovery and compliance. So the management of information and records from a compliance perspective. Whereas when we do our surveys, um, where people get the actual return on investment from their applications is when they focus on process. So the automation, uh, the minimization of paper bottlenecks. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting spin in terms of the, the motivation behind the deployment of ECM, but where people see the actual value. Um, so there is a, absolutely a, a, a global distinction in terms of the primary business case or reason to deploy ECM. Because in Germany, records management is a hard to sell topic, only few industry know it. E-discovery, we are glad that you do not search. Oh, you do search, but there's the other department, the NSA. And uh, um, we still believe that there is a difference because in Germany we have so special developments like the email or electronic signature of high quality uh, which really separates still the market but if we talk about disruptive um, yet what's your opinion how does the industry react on these figures 
because if the end users say we are not satisfied, well, there must be at least some reaction. Or do you see any reaction by the industries on your, your figures? Well, I'll start, um, and you can comment. Uh, but the reaction that we're seeing, and we, we noticed this in the, uh, the WAVE report that we published uh, last week, is that the vendors are beginning to take notice of this you know, difficulty in terms of adoption and are investing significantly in improving things like user experience, the UI, support for mobile, and uh, the ability to uh, open up their APIs so that other kind of uh, applications and user interfaces can be built on top of their content platforms. So we do see that the, uh, the vendors are responsible responding to this kind of sluggish uh, adoption level. Oh, she's hopeful. <laughs> Gert, do you have the, the impression that they really do this? I think you have been talking to all European vendors in the last years, and do you have the impression that they have something like a plan, like a vision, how to deal with all of this? I have an um, answer, and I will deal with this uh, partly in my presentation as well. In your presentation, I will answer this. Okay, okay, so let's have a look. At least I will address it. Um, yes, we are an M&A um, uh, advisory company. It means basically we help our clients yeah. to either sell their business or to uh, help them in targeting the right companies to acquire in order to further fuel their growth. However, one of the main aspect that remains unnoticed in the sort of work what we do is where we work sometimes for many years with small and medium-sized companies, typically highly innovative companies, in helping and guiding them through the phase where our main task is protecting them almost for not just focusing on uh, developing the best or the most innovative technology, but also keep an open eye on developing uh, shareholder value. This is something that remains uh, unnoticed in the many uh, fast-growing companies with a focus on technology. So I want to stay for a moment and, and have a look at M&A in particular. M&A um, is, whatever we say about it, a big and uh, controversial thing. At the moment, the news comes out that a deal has taken place and you're working in one of the companies, the first question you ask yourself, hey, will I still be in the same role next year? Or if it's a positive thing, positively perceived, hey, will this create more career uh, opportunity for me? But even more importantly, if you look at the R&D departments of uh, technology firms, the key question comes up, hey, will this R&D facility remain at the place where I'm working right now? Or will it transfer over to India? Will it go over to the place of the, of the buying company? So it has simply a, a significant impact on operations from every angle. Uh, at least when it's not com communicated correctly. We see a lot of activity right now in the ECM, BPM and document processing area, typically along the traditional lines of uh, uh, deciding about what to do. Uh, it's all aimed at how can we increase our growth, um, uh, reduce our risk, and the majority of the deals which we see taking place right now is all about how can we expand geographically, uh, how can we gain access to new customer bases or gain some uh, domain knowledge? And sometimes it's even just a war game. Just yesterday I had a conversation with a company. I said, you know, our co competitors are acquiring, so we have to do something as well. Um, where we are looking at the relationship between M&A and innovation, um, a couple of years ago there was a study conducted by the... Um, Kelly School of Business in uh, the US, Indiana, where they uh, uh, did a survey, conducted a survey under almost 400 executives of pharma and life science companies. And the outcome was quite interesting. 82% of those executives simply stated that regardless of the size of their companies, that they had lost their own innovation capability and that this would put an enormous increase in pressure on further acquisitions and meaning a stronger focus on those small tech firms that could fill the pipeline of new innovations in, the, in moving forward. It's also witnessed by the number of patents, um, uh, positive announcements which were made afterwards. So it, it was a, a clear evidence how the relationship is. The key question is, how does this relate to the ECM, BPM and... Um, uh, document processing industry. A couple of months ago, 
I chaired a roundtable discussion around M&A with quite a number of leaders, CEOs, out of this particular industry. Um, we discussed the way M&A had an impact on this industry and what we could expect in the next couple of years. And one interesting question came up during that discussion. That was how the structure of the ECM BPM industry would look like in the next five to seven years. And we made a comparison between uh, what has happened in the database industry, what has happened in the ERP uh, sector, compared to what happened now. And there was a common sense among the table with almost 15 executives, so it was not a large group, but it was an intensive discussion, that if you look at the database industry, just a few, a handful of uh, major vendors, but the ERP industry has gone through a major consolidation in the last 10 years, with just around, if you look at it closely, 20 vendors still actively globally, and the remaining typically focused on a niche, focused on a certain geography, um, and if you look at the ECM BPM industry, look at Germany, look at France, uh, we've got five, six big companies over here. Um, there will be a big consolidation in the next couple of years moving forward and the consensus is that it will go into the ERP type of characteristics uh, in the next couple of years moving forward. Just give me a few more minutes. Uh, um, the dynamics are clear, I will skip this uh, sheet uh, very quickly. Cloud is a uh, good example, I just want to touch on it for a moment. I've spoken with many vendors here in Germany and they have said to me, Geert, cloud computing, forget about it for the next uh, near future because our clients are not asking for it. If you go out to the US, it's growing like wildfire. So guess what will happen on the M&A side with companies that are not putting the right pressure on these sort of dynamics, cloud, mobile, multi, everything, where in the US these things are taking uh, the market by storm. So what I wanted to do next is looking, this is all technology and market from a vendor perspective, I'd like to take a user uh, perspective as well. But I need two more minutes. Okay, yeah. I mean, if, or, if we look at the user community, typically you're all looking at risk-free purchases, future-proof, it needs to at least uh, last for another five to seven years and needs to integrate with everything. So avoiding as much as possible risk. But how does this resonate in looking at innovations, the latest technology to apply? But because typically, these innovations do not come from the largest firms you work with. Um, this is trying to get an answer back to you. Um, what we see with these small companies, they struggle. They struggle big time in order to get their message out to the market. They simply are inadequate to articulate the benefits of their innovations. It's, um, uh, and it results also in, 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 the, in the mistakes they make in targeting the wrong customers. They should target the innovators, not the companies that are uh, not willingly to take a risk. I'll skip this uh, quicker. So my last message to the, to the user community is, if you want to look at competitive advantage, if you really want to able to find a technology that cuts your cost or that helps you to improve your uh, capabilities, then... Um, be sure that if you look at innovations, um, operate in greenfield operations, ask other companies to lead your projects, and uh, accept the risk that is involved with it. And if it's a business critical uh, infrastructure, can't afford risk, well, then you may need to look at more established vendors in that respect. So the um, buyer's behavior, purchasing technology, can have an influence and uh, stimulate innovation if done correctly. Thank you. Stay here. You were fast, but not fast enough. I will uh, set the price for a minute. The price for a minute, for an extra minute, is one bottle of Maud whiskey, at least 20 years old. Um, we, 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 we talk about that later. Um, do you think, if you look around these booths here, we have yet at least three companies who were bought recently who have still a known booth, Deja, bought by IBM, yep. over there, Superion, bought by Perceptive, and there's another small one over there. Um, will there be such many booths here? Will there coming up new booths? Or will the innovative companies in ECM don't go here? Uh, no new booths, uh, but less uh, vendors as we see nowadays. Sorry. Okay. There will be no new booths but there will be less booth from some of the vendors that we see here being present nowadays. So we are in a dis de decreasing status of the traditional ECM industry. 
Is that your opinion as well, Rich? What's the question? Oh, we're in a decreasing state of the industry, losing vendors. Well, Take a microphone, otherwise you go get you on well, the video. Well, there are, there are in the core areas, absolutely, but there are folks coming in, so you do get new blood, coming in from social and from infrastructure and so on. So it may be a stable state. No, I totally agree. I'm referring to the traditional ECM BPM vendors as we see nowadays. And uh, these vendors will be confronted with a roll-up and major consolidation in the next couple of years moving forward. You know, one, one of the other things on that point is that with our survey that buyers make 60% of the buying decision before they even engage a vendor. So if somebody wants to find out about document management, they don't need to come to a show to do it. They can go onto the internet and find everything they need. Cheryl. Yeah. And just to that point, I mean, when we look at uh, what uh, organization strategies are around ECM, I mean, we continue to see people uh, have the vision of reducing the number of platforms that they're using in-house. So going from, you know, four vendors to three down to one or, you know, SharePoint and one other vendor. So it's interesting to see how that uh, consolidation on the enterprise side is happening as well.